I feel like I'm in Bergheim. This is cool. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, thank you everybody for coming. And uh, thank you, May, for, for doing this today. Yeah, thank you, Darian. And congratulations on raising 200 million. That's uh, quite a lot of money. Thank so, you so much. Um, it's, it's been a wild journey. I mean, tell us about the journey. Yeah, well, first, thank you, uh, Antigradient, because you guys were one of our first backers. And I think the very first um, seed fund we met that was only doing AI, which, you know, three and a half, four years ago was, was definitely pretty... It was not cool. It was not cool for a <laughs> long time. And then suddenly we're cool. So I, yeah. I, it, it just, it's interesting, you know? Well, we that's were... sort of us, too. <laughs> um, we, we've been doing um, really NLP, me and my co-founder, since 2012. So we've been in this space for a long time. And when we started Writer, it was because we had started using encoder decoders in our first company, a machine translation company. And, you know, this is 2019, early 2020, and, um, you know, decoder-only uh, transformers were not very good at translation then. And actually, when we, when we started the company, I really didn't even think we'd be able to do, tran like, language translation with the technology. But you know, what we thought would happen um, to really reading and writing uh, with this tech was something we couldn't look away from. So we started Writer in 2020. I think we're the only company that has built product on top of every generation of Transformer. So it has definitely meant, you know, lots of rapid change in, in the past four years. And now essentially, you know, we've got a family of Transformers that are really good at reasoning, really good at tool calling, really good at essentially building tools for the enterprise, and um, we are enterprise-focused today. Yeah, I mean, I think one of the, one of the most interesting things about Writer relative to other, bu other businesses in AI that serve the enterprise is that you're training your own models. You're not reliant on open AI, you're not reliant on Anthropic, and you've been able to do it at, with a relatively small budget. Can you tell me how that's possible? I mean, both you and Wasim are, are, are brilliant, but, you know, both of you didn't come from Google, you didn't come from the places that a lot of these transformer-based AI companies came from, like the team from Anthropic, obvious that they know how to do it, but you've been able to develop some of the highest performing models with a low budget, with a team that hasn't been steeped in the research. So maybe tell, me, tell us about that, it's super impressive. Yeah, well, you know, we were some of the very first people to commercialize T5 and BERT. So, you know, our understanding and, and um, depth with Transformers goes back a really long time. Um, and we've been willing to, because of that, um, really innovate on the architecture. I mean, the vast majority of folks building um, LLMs have got a pretty vanilla um, architecture and uh, just yesterday Wasim was at Cerebral Valley in San Francisco. There's an um, information piece about it yesterday. Um, we have started talking about our self-evolving architecture. So uh, think of it as infinite memory for, for LLMs. And it's actually the first time we have talked about research breakthroughs ahead of product. We have always said uh, we are a product company, not a research lab. And so what we take to enterprises and even in a design alpha, um, our customers are Goldman Sachs and Accenture and United Healthcare and you know, big companies. And you got to take a pretty fully baked thing to them, even as you know, it's called an alpha or, or a beta. Anyway, this is the first time that um, we are, we're talking about the, the breakthroughs we're making in, in research. And a big part of that is we are hiring for 100 plus open roles. So like literally 200 plus positions. Um, in and London and San Francisco. London, correct? San Francisco. And then in the US, we're doing hubs in Chicago and Austin. Wow, yep. wow. And the, the piece and in the, the information struck me as particularly interesting because what you're saying is that the LLMs can outpace some of the scaling challenges that we heard about last week, <laughs> where more data is, that there's not enough data to make these models better. So now you're basically saying that infinite memory or a memory pool, what the interactivity is between the end user and the model can actually self-improve that model and outperform the sort of base case model. Maybe talk a little bit about how like, that would be used in the enterprise and some of the yeah. Fortune 500 customers. So we started to see this really last year, and, and we've been you know, educating the analyst community and, and journalists about it. Um, what we do, you could really think of as, an, as a compound AI system. So 
We've got models um, that are really good at reasoning. So this is our Palmyra X family. And um, think of models that are good at reasoning as almost deeper than they are wide. And we pair them with domain-specific models that are wide, <laughs> but wide in a specific domain. And, and part of that was, you know, starting a couple years ago, we realized how um, non-scalable it is to fine-tune for customer use cases. It's very hard to maintain and update. Um, and so we're almost like pre-fine-tuning these domain-specific models for healthcare, for financial services, these are our domain-specific models, um, for creative writing, for customer support, and then pairing them with the models that do the heavy kind of reasoning lifting. And um, what you realize as well is for so many of the knowledge retrieval types of interactions, especially as it comes to autonomous action, which we should talk about um, kind of this next era of functionality for, for the writer platform, you really want to be able to remember the nuances of, oh, this is interesting. You know, I don't do roller coasters and stuff, so <laughs> I, if I vomit on stage, please forgive me. I um, thought it was about to pass out, actually. <laughs> it started to move and I got a little bit worried. Now it's actually showing my bald spots. So I, I <laughs> <laughs> we can have AI for that. I yeah. know. Can you help me out with that? Seriously, this is an enterprise use case right here. Um, this is cool and, and like, yeah, slightly um, perturbing. Uh, <laughs> so we, uh, now I lost my, my train of thought. Um, no, you were talking about autonomous action and the, it's like a new era for a writer. Um, I've never heard of an autonomous action. Like, tell us about that. Yeah, well, so when you think about why we're a full stack solution in the first place. So. Um, we call full stack uh, generative AI, um, generative AI that puts together LLMs with the microservices that LLMs need to do powerful things in the enterprise. So for us, that is LLMs with built-in RAG. So this is graph-based RAG, not vector-based RAG. That's really tightly coupled with our models, guardrails orchestration and observability, and a studio that makes it really easy for business users to really contribute the business logic, the examples, the data that these use cases need um, to, to be accurate and, and to be easily maintained. And so that full stack generative AI uh, platform is, is, is the heart of, of what we do. And what we've learned in four and a half years now of selling to the enterprise and, and how we got to full stack is the enterprise really wants end-to-end -end complete solutions. And you know, as we built these incredibly accurate, scalable, in-production applications for everything from you know, creating like SKU content for new uh, digital shelves at L'Oreal to uh, legal contract review applications at a Johnson & Johnson, like the systems that those outputs need to integrate into and the systems that our users are going in to get the inputs into the apps. Integrating all of that would really make adoption um, much easier and, and change management much easier. And so the more powerful the LLMs have gotten, the more of a workflow you can actually, the more of a human workflow you can actually collapse into a AI one, but you need to be able to really accurately and reliably connect into systems um, that have really AI doing a lot of the reasoning um, for kind of the micro, the micro steps. And so now that the models are capable of it, we're leading the Berkeley um, uh, tool calling leaderboard, it really comes down to productizing, right? How, think of it as the nodes in the workflow that someone has built into Writer connect into the systems for upstream and downstream uh, in integration. So that whole thing we're calling autonomous action. Yeah, and I, I want to clarify also for the audience, if you're, if you're welcome to share what percentage of the Fortune 500 have implemented some form of Writer so far? Yeah, well, some form. I mean, we, we actually really drive for um, leadership. So some form does not, does not the work. bar for us, yeah, right? Yeah, it's all or nothing. It's all or nothing. I mean, you know, it's not all or nothing from a budget perspective. These are companies who know space is moving really fast and, you know, despite conviction, need to have lots of experiments going at, at the same time. And we should talk about kind of go to market. Um, but, you know, we need to maintain generative AI leadership in the account, and we have generative AI leadership in 40 of the Fortune 500. 
It's amazing. It's really amazing. And, and only in a couple of years. I mean, I think it's important for the audience to understand that the three components that she talked about, observability, graph rag, as well as the semantic retrieval piece, and, and the components that make up what the writer platform is, there are dozens of venture-backed companies that do little piecemeal components of this. And enterprises are looking for a wall-to-wall, one-size-fits-all solution for generative AI. And I think that like, that's the platform that you've built. And I could see every, every company in the world adopting it. Can you talk a little about the model ensemble solution that you have, like the ability to link the different models and how that is creating an agent product and what you see as the agentic product that comes out of this? Sure. Yeah. So we actually don't use the word agentic in any of our marketing and anywhere in our app because it's lost like all meaning. Yeah. And what we've been doing for years is what people are calling agentic now, which is, let's say you are um, uh, building an application that helps financial advisors at Prudential, they're a customer, um, be able to give better advice to folks who are trying to decide what retirement annuity to buy. Uh, real use case. There's a lot of business logic that goes in to building a use case like that. And so what we do is, you know, chain together almost micro apps that are each paired with a different model, a different rag pipeline, different sets of examples, different sets of business logic. Now there's smoke as well. I love it. I know. Yeah. I know. <laughs> That's the seven minute warning. Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> no, <it's not. laughs> so when you kind of chain all of that um, together, this is what folks are now calling agentic. We don't call that agentic. That's kind of the business logic scaffolding around, um, uh, around the use case. For us, what we call agentic, right, is the model's ability to use external tools and systems that either the data comes from or the output needs to go to. Uh, to be able to solve that um, specific workflow end-to-end. -end. So, for example, um, that retirement um, advisor put uh, notes in Salesforce um, and then, you know, has a meeting with them, uh, with, with their client, and then the recording of that conversation sits in yet another system, maybe a homegrown system. Being able to piece all that together end-to-end -end is what we're calling autonomous action. Um, and it, in Writer, it almost works as a super app that connects other applications in Writer to systems and workflows that AI then navigates on behalf of the user. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, I could see, I mean, the, the market that comes to mind, just one off the top of my head, is insurance claims, processing insurance claims. Multi billion dollars, hundreds of thousands of people are doing that. Being able to have AI automate that use case, I mean, that could extend to many different verticals beyond whether it's credit card claims or statement reconciliation, financial reconciliation. I mean, can you talk about some of the core use cases for this autonomous action that you're seeing in yeah. various industries? So we're really industry focused because you got to speak the language of the customer and kind of the marquee workflows that you present have to be different depending on who you're, you're talking to. So the killer applications really vary by industry. So in pharma, if you are Novartis or AstraZeneca, the stuff that gets you very excited is medical and legal review of you know, everything that's required to take a drug to market from literally the call scripts of the sales reps, right? When they walk up to um, a, uh, a academic oncologist, right, versus a community oncologist, literally the script is different by, dr by drug, right? And writer is generating that in a way that is legally compliant by region, right? And, Luckily, these reps don't travel around too much, so if you build a script, an objection handling document for a rep that's going up you know, in, in Spain, that is going to look different than someone who's trying to sell the drug in, in the UK or, or in, um, in the US. And so being able to take these kind of micro workflows on drug commercialization and automate steps end to end, it's very different than going in and you know, talking to a um, insurer, right, about claim adjudication and being able to take, you know, a nurse who is reviewing a 300-page medical um, file, right, and, and that summarization going from eight hours to two hours. So you really um, have to make sure that the whole team understands how to put 
all of the building blocks of a full stack solution together in a way that presents a uh, solution to the buyer that is just really outside in. Because what we've learned is, you know, folks don't really have an imagination. You can't be like, look, this huge market map of generative AI tools, we've put it all in one thing for you. So instead of it taking eight months starting with OpenAI, it'll take you like eight days with Writer. Um, you really have to paint the picture in a very tangible way for them to understand just the like, explosion of value you get when all of it's already linked. Right, and so I, I, when I was a founder, one of the biggest challenges, we were touching sensitive customer data, but not as much as you are. Like you are in, like these Fortune 500s, you're having, you have access to pretty much all of their data to build sort of the brain that they use to make decisions and launch different, you know, the, the, the features that you have to automate human workflows. How do you get customers to be okay with giving the keys to all their data? I, I think, you know, the, the contention that a lot of people have right now is that Microsoft and Google and will, will likely be able to use that they already have security, or their full th through security review with a lot of customers and they can go in and sell their products. How are you able to get the customer to be excited about you and then also to push you through security review, get approval, and actually have access to their full data set. Yeah, this is huge. Yeah. And it's not really sexy, but literally the answer is data retention. Wow. <laughs> and we can make promises about data retention because we own every layer of the stack. We're not taking, you know, merger proxy documents from an investment bank that aren't public yet and haven't been filed yet. And we're sending them to a third-party LLM and a third-party vector DB and a third-party embeddings model. And like, not only that, like, you really can't control inference at the end because it's a crappy consumer and end user experience um, because you're literally waiting on like four or five different APIs that you don't you don't control. So that's number one is we control the entire stack down to the LLM, and so we can actually like walk through in a very transparent way what's happening to their data, what happens to it at the end. Um, it's literally UI. You don't even need to do this via APIs in terms of like setting out um, what the data retention policies are for various teams and various use cases in, in Writer. And then, you know, the whole platform sits in a, in a single tenant environment in the customer's cloud. Wow, so it's a full hybrid cloud solution. Yeah. Okay, okay. And do you offer, like, hybrid cloud on-premise, or hybrid cloud and, and full cloud? Or? Yeah, no, not, not no on-prem. On-premise, sorry. Yeah, but, like, own spoke. cloud um, as well as, as I mean, multi-tenant is also incredibly secure. So, right. you know, you'd be surprised at actually, you know, who's comfortable with multi-tenant. Right, folks have gotten pretty um, comfortable like underwriting um, security, high security SaaS. Mm. Um, and if somebody you know uses Wiz and uses Salesforce, we're in business from a multi-tenant perspective. You know. Right, and that's an easier process than a full high Yeah, that's easier. Yeah, and yeah. It, it costs less for the customer. Interesting, interesting. And you know, so you raised two hundred million. What are you going to do with the money? Can yeah. you talk about that? Yeah, so that's a lot, it's a lot of money. It's, I mean, it's, it's not as much as the other AI companies yeah. that are training models. So how do you think about it vis-a-vis -vis them as well? As maybe? Yeah, well, we have gross margins in the high 80s, right? So we can do a lot more with 200 mil than, um, than everybody else. Um, and so, you know, it, sure, that came up in diligence, right? Like, May, where are you hiding all the money you spent to build these models? And we're like, it's right there, right? Um, and, and yes, you know, NVIDIA is a customer, they're a great partner, Jensen's a fan, all those things. Um, and, you know, we've built models that we train very efficiently, we use synthetic data and all the things that have made it so, you know, we can build state-of-the-art models without burning, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars. Um, but uh, the raise is really about us coming into this next, um, this next phase of autonomous action. So building end-to-end -end workflows that can connect to systems and teams um, in this uh, really complete way for, for customers. Um, we're hiring a ton, literally 100 plus positions. I'm May at writer.com. Anybody who wants to talk about any of the EPD or go-to-market positions that we've got open. Um, but, you know, it is, it's, it's ours for the taking. I, like, it's, it's shocking how wide the enterprise lane is. Yes, it's very confusing, and it's generative AI everywhere, everything all at once. Um, but, you know, there are very few people who are trying to solve um, these challenges for enterprises in a, in a complete way, frankly. It's amazing. So, 
Maybe starting with the beginning of the company, can you talk a little bit about the Jasper writer dynamic? Because Jasper emerged and, and also writer at one point was also similar and you decided to go full enterprise. How did you make that decision and that pivot? And then how, it was very early in the, in the phase of the company and why did you make that decision? Yeah, and I think that um, the, the sets of lessons we've learned from actually having different competitors like every six months. It, it's <laughs> a, honestly, we train on it, we onboard to it, like this is part of our founding story that we have been able to follow and productize every step function change in the capabilities of the models. And, and we say now to our customers, generative AI speed isn't just for generative AI companies, it's for anybody that wants to lead their industry. And when we started, our competitors were Grammarly, right? Because well, what, were, what were Transformers good at in 2020? Really editing stuff, right? And so for, for us, that first you know, set of competitors um, were, were the, the incumbents that weren't using Transformers, right, to impute the laws of the English language. And so you know, we could do more interesting things with a smaller group of people, price it differently, et cetera. Then, you know, as, as the decoder only transformers got more powerful, right, we were selling to, to marketing teams. So we went from selling to writing teams to selling to marketing teams. That's when we encountered, you know, the, the Jasper competition. Um, as the models got even more powerful, right, and we connected them to customer data, um, you know, that was then really the start of our, our retrieval functionality and hence our ability to build knowledge assistance. Because we were really close to sales and marketing teams, the, build, the first knowledge assistants that we built were for sales onboarding and um, you know, product um, marketing and product information types of use cases. And then we expanded from there, right? And so with this vertical focus X use cases and those use cases now going from you know, apps to knowledge assistance to now real full-blown software applications, um, who we have sold to has changed, how we have sold has changed, who the competitors are. And so we literally have to be willing and are willing to throw away everything every six months and restart um, we train the sales team on a continuous basis. Literally, there is a sales kickoff every quarter. Uh, we do something called demo domination. It's an always-on road show. There's a 100, 200, and 300 series, depending on how long you've been at the company. And God help you if you are caught using slides from fucking January. You know, seriously. Uh, and so <laughs> you just have to build a company that is in a constant change, uh, state of change, um, and, you know, we, 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 we make that a, a value and, and part of how we go to market. It's amazing. I mean, so you've innovated on the go to market model and the, com and the technology, yeah. which I rarely see in these AI companies. Yeah. Um, that's, a, that's, that's quite amazing. Switching topics quickly, some of the, the, the innovations that we've seen in AI and generative AI have been really around every iteration of these foundational models as they ingest more data and there are new techniques that are sort of employed, these models get better than humans at certain things. So they're better at coding certain tasks, they're better at reading comprehension at certain tasks, they're better at math, especially your model with, the mem with using memory are better at, than humans. Is there a plateau coming that everyone's talking about where these models are not going to get that much better because we've run out of data, run out of new innovative techniques, the research is stale, how do you see that? Do they need to be better for the enterprise use cases? Is it time that these companies all started to focus on go-to-market rather than like improving research? How do you think about, about that? So, so the, the, the TLDR is on vanilla transformer X internet scale data, right? We have, we've, we've asymptoted, right? We've, we've hit that plateau. But there's no way in the world us or anybody else has actually plateaued, right? Because yeah. you can innovate on data, you can innovate on architecture, you can innovate on, uh, on, on compute. Now, like on data, what we started doing a year plus ago um, is really go to this compound um, structure where we're able to synthesize data that is better for training LLMs, right? And you think about it logically, like all the data out there is built for human consumption. What if that data were built for LLM consumption, right? That's essentially, we've built helper LLMs that synthesize data and then structure it for LLM training. 
Um, and so, you know, we've been able to push the envelope um, on, on data, we've been able to push the envelope on the algorithms, right? And that's what um, was, was in the news the, the last couple of days. And just everybody is working on these problems. Like, there's no way that these models don't get a lot better, but, you know, we're going to end up with just a lot more species of models. Right now, you know, it's really kind of one um, avenue, and, you know, this will look a lot more like, you know, just the, you know, evolutionary kind of explosion of, um, of, of different fields of research. Yeah, I mean, I think it presents an opportunity for you guys because now that OpenAI, GPT-5, their initial versions aren't better than O1 in certain ways, that gives you an opportunity to really employ some of your techniques for your specific enterprise use cases. Um, so it's super exciting. I encourage everyone to follow May and Ryder on Twitter, LinkedIn, Thanks, or, or sorry, X, not Twitter anymore. <laughs> um, and uh, thank you very much for the thank time you, and Darren. thank you to everybody thank else. Thank you so much thank for you. everything.